So I'm happy to be here today and we have a speaker here today that is the epitome of overcoming. I had her yesterday at the foundation we have in Austin. We spent the better part of the night before talking about what's happened to her and believe me this is a story that is amazing. It starts up here, it comes down here, in the end it ends up super great. But it's heavy. She speaks a little fast because she comes from Orange County, California via New York, so if you get my drift. But let me tell you, her story is riveting. And I want to tell you, she's done so many things for children and she's got a huge project going on right now for children that age out in Los Angeles. And I cannot tell you enough. I read her book twice on Kindle and I read the hard copy once just to get it all down. But I want to introduce to you, give her a big Corpus Christi round of applause for Lori Burns. Hi, I'm Lori. I can't tell you what an honor and a privilege it is to be here today with all of the people that support our foster children. I do tend to talk fast. As I get older, my life gets longer and there's more to crunch in. So <laughs> I also tend to cry like Jennifer when I speak. So if um, I make you cry, that's a good thing. That means um, we transmit it. I always pray God in before I speak that he should transmit to you what you need to have to help our children. So I'm gonna get right into it. I am from New York, as Ted said. I was born in an alcoholic family. My father was an alcoholic. My mom took a lot of pills to shut out my dad. And I have two sisters, one older, one younger. And from the time I can remember, I believed in God. I believed I had done something in a past life, like maybe I was a witch or something. And I was doing time in this life to pay him back. So that was my understanding. My father was physically abusive on me and sexually abusive on my older sister and my little sister hit out a lot. And um, I failed to bond to humans as a child. The only thing I ever bonded to was a little dog that I had. I had a little pug. And um, I was in trouble a lot as a kid. I was um, suicidal from the get-go. I never wanted to be here. I was uh, smoking, stealing, hitchhiking, you name it, anything that I could do to get a little control in my life because I didn't have it behind the doors of our house. Oh, I, um, I was brought up Jewish, so I went to Hebrew school and temple, but we were mostly talking Hebrew, so that didn't conflict with my already thinking about um, God and not liking me. So between my God, my God not liking me, my father not liking me, I wasn't in a good place with myself. When I, when I would act up at home, my parents would take me to psychiatrists and psychologists to see what was the matter with my brain, because better to say something's wrong with Lori than to actually look at our family. So I was on a lot of medication. I went to see psychiatrists, psychologists. Once a year, I would have wires put in my head. I think it was called an EEG to see what was the matter with my brain. And it just went on like that. When I was 13, right after my bat mitzvah, my mom left us in New York with my dad. Um, her plan was to go to California to build a life for us and then send for us. To my mom's credit, she had no money. My father controlled all the money and she had no resources to go with. So I was not mad at my mom for leaving. As a matter of fact, I was grateful that somebody got out. So she left and she left us alone with my dad. But when she left us alone with my dad, things really started to escalate. I look a lot like my mom. So he got more angry with me. And although I say, um, my sister was being molested by my dad. I never clearly saw that. It was just kind of um, apparent in the fact that my dad was an airline pilot, which should make you feel safe if you're traveling this weekend. But um, they, I, I believe they check now. They didn't check so much in the 70s. Um, but he would, as after my mom left, he would um, lock me out of the house so he could be alone with my sister. When he would go on airline trips when my mom was there, he would come home with presents for my sister and not my mom. And my sister lived in a different part of the house. She had an upstairs room. So as an abused child, I was aware of everything that went on in our house. So now that my mom's gone, his violence on me is increasing. My dad had a handgun that he carried at all times. I never thought about it when I was a kid. Why does a pilot need a handgun? Because it just was. It was always that way. My mom and dad's closet, which used to 
carry clothes in it, now transitioned to an alcohol storage closet. My dad had cases of Smirnoffs in there. So now my dad was going away on trips somewhere. My mom used to be there and he would go away. Sometimes he'd leave a babysitter and sometimes he wasn't. He wouldn't. And you know, there wasn't so much about latchkey kids in that, those days. So there were some kids that were left at home alone where they shouldn't have been. So there was um, a time when my dad went away on a trip and no one was with us. And I thought I would have my friend Jeanette spend the night and Jeanette and I would hitchhike to McDonald's. Now this was our usual shtick. We would hitchhike to McDonald's, we'd hang out, we'd smoke cigarettes, eat french fries and maybe get in a fight because it's New York, right? So um, Jeanette spends the night and in the morning we're getting ready to go to McDonald's and we start looking for the blow dryers to blow dry our hair and we can't find them. And Jeanette's somewhere in the house and I'm back in the bathroom and all of a sudden I hear the garage door open. Now at the age of 13 I'm like a skilled war veteran in regards to where my dad is in the house at all times. I could tell by the pace of his footsteps if he's angry. That isn't something that I did consciously, that is something that I did subconsciously. Still where I work today as an old person, I know everyone's footsteps in the office. I could tell you who's coming before they appear. So I was programmed as an abused child to keep myself safe. So I'm in the bathroom and I hear the garage door open below and I know my dad is the only one that comes in through the garage door. So I hear the garage door open and I hear my dad come up. The bathroom door is almost closed so I can't see what's going on but I hear him come up, go down the hallway, go into his bedroom, set his pilot hat down, his briefcase down and then it gets quiet and then he busts into the bathroom and he's got the blow dryer in his hand. He starts beating me and I'm stuck in between like the toilet and the wall because I'm trying to get away from him and he's beating me and he's very angry and he's hitting the wall with the blow dryer and the plaster is coming out and I guess Jeanette's somewhere else in the house and she comes running into the bathroom and sees him and gasped and when she gasped he turned around and saw her and she saw him and it was like a equally resident shock for two completely different reasons. She's like oh my god look at Lori because I'm a pretty tough little kid when I'm with my friends but now I'm cowering in the corner and he's like oh my god somebody's in the house. No one has ever witnessed the abuse that goes on in our house. So she went into the kitchen and called her mom and my dad went into the bedroom and closed the door probably thinking what do I do now. Her mom came over and got me, took me back to their house, and her mom and dad were talking to me about what happened, and I was frankly embarrassed that they knew what goes on in our house, and I didn't say much, but they talked to me and they said it was going to be okay. And then my dad called up over to their house and they said, he said, you know, Lori's crazy. She's suicidal. She's been to see psychiatrists. She's on meds right now. She lies a lot. And I think Jeanette's parents thought, this is way too much for us to get involved in. Look, Lori, he knows we know. Probably nothing will happen again now that he knows we know. So my dad comes over to get me, take me home. He puts me in the car and we drive home. He doesn't talk to me on the drive home, but that's normal for my dad. But when we get to the door, he holds the door open kind of politely. So I think, my dad's not a polite guy really, he maybe he heard something. When I walk through the threshold of the door, his fist hits me so hard in the back of the spine that I hit the floor and I realize, oh my God, he's really angry, I gotta get out. And I think I got enough nerve just from hearing from Jeanette's parents to get out, just hearing that it wasn't right what was going on. And I ran around the dining room table and out the front door and I hid in the bushes till he stopped looking for me. And I hitchhike over to my friend Erin's house and Erin's like a latchkey kid, like she had a single mom who was never home and she had a little brother and they smoked a lot of pot so I thought, you know, I could crash at Erin's house, right? So um, I get to Erin's house and I call home and I said, I'm at Erin's and I'm not coming home and I hung up. And that was my dad who answered. And I realize now that was a fatal flaw in my plan. I shouldn't have told my dad where I was, but at the age of 13, that was what I did. You know, that was all I knew. So I'm at Aaron's, and in the middle of the night that night, the phone rings, and it's an aunt of mine. She said, Lori, I'm at the house. The police are here. We know you have your dad's gun, and we're coming to get you. Now, I didn't have my dad's gun, um, but my dad would pull crazy stories all the time. Um, and I was just surprised they're calling in the middle of the night. So my aunt comes against me, takes me back to the house, and there's a bunch of police officers sitting at the table with my dad. And my dad's got a look on his face that I know only too well. He's got this look where his lips are tight, and he looks at me, and I know he's thinking, if you talk, so I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to say anything, but the police keep on asking me about this gun. And I told them, I know my dad's gun. I've seen my dad's gun. I don't have my dad's gun. Finally, they got tired of questioning me and the police left and they sent me to bed. And I went into my bedroom. I can't believe I'm back in this house again. And my aunt comes into the room a little while later and she kneels down next to my bed. And she said, Lori, I just saw your dad and your sister sneak the gun out of the oven. And I know they were trying to set you up, but if you tell on your dad, he will lose his job at the airlines. And then what will happen to you children? And I remember thinking about, it. I hated my dad. Like if I knew a hit kid at school, I would have saved lunch money to pay him. You know what I mean? To off my dad. But at the same time, I knew everything that my dad thought about me resonated within me. I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't pretty enough. I wasn't even lovable, right? So I always hoped that someday he would decide that he loved me. And if I told on him, he would never love me. And I knew that. So I told my aunt, I'm not gonna tell on him, it's okay. 
and she left my room and I finally got to sleep and in the morning I was woken up by a different police officer and he asked me to get dressed and he walked me down to a police car in the driveway to put me in the back seat and we drove. And when we got on the freeway, I didn't know where we were going. I didn't know if this was a rescue from Jeanette's parents or where I was going. But again, in the 70s, I don't think little people talk so much to big people. There was a big generation gap there, you know? And so I'm in the back seat, and I'm so scared that there's like an imprint of my nails in the little cushion on the side. And when we pull off of the freeway and I see the dark gates of Central Iceland Mental Institution for the criminally insane and we start to go down the path I realize that I'm going into this big building with the bars on the windows and I realize oh my god Lori you should have said something you should have told those police officers yesterday this isn't right you're going in here and the man handed me off to a guard inside and there were men attacking the door to get at me and um, in this place I was more suicidal than ever pilgrims State, Kings Park, and Central Islip is what they wrote. One flew over the cuckoo's nest after, and they had stopped doing lobotomies about seven years before I got there. And it was not a kid's place. I was more suicidal than ever. I was taking anything I could to try and cut my wrist. They put me in a solitary room. They put me in a straight jacket, and they tied the arms of the straight jacket around the bed, and they drugged me. And on the heels of my bat mitzvah, which was, should, should have been a time where... Um, where I formulate a relationship with God. It was more than I could reconcile in my soul, and it created um, this spiritual downfall that would, I would experience for the next 10 years. My mom kept on calling back to the house to see how I was doing, and my dad and sister kept on saying, she's outside playing, oh, she's outside playing, oh, you missed her again. And finally, my mom realized after a bit of time that I wasn't even there. She knew how crazy my dad was. She found someone who could get me out. And um, they found me in that place. They found that a kid was admitted to Central Iceland and she got me out, but she didn't have enough money to get me out to California yet. So I was sent to a group home in Stony Brook, New York, and that was where I met my people for the first time. Other kids like me, little kids that were so strong, other kids that were abandoned and abused. And for the first time in my life, I would bond to another human being and I had met my family. And by the time my mom got enough money to get me to California, I didn't want to leave these little kids because um, they were everything I knew, but I had to come. So I went to California and the message was just forget everything that happened back there and let's start over again. But I could not forget what had happened back there between my dad and the mental institution. It was all right here. So I spiraled down quickly and I ended up in the foster care system, juvenile hall, group homes, um, running from everywhere I went to. I was um, level 14, AWOL, suicide risk and they, it was got very hard to place me. I went through a lot of um, pre-placement trials. By the time I was 16, I was going to continuation school, and I met a girl there, and I started to shoot up, shoot up drugs intravenously. And by the time I was 18, I aged out of foster care. I got quickly pregnant. I was still hooked on intravenous drugs, and I moved into a motel on Harbor Boulevard where we live and I was on welfare. And I realized at some point, you know, I need more money. And I remember the day I decided, you know what, I'm gonna open the drawer, I'm gonna open, find the yellow pages, and I'm gonna see if I can work somewhere to make some money, right? And what I was looking for was prostitution, which isn't in the yellow pages, by the way. Um, but I opened the hotel room drawer, and the hotel room drawer that day was like a crossroads for me. There was a Bible, and there was the yellow pages. So are you going to pray about it, or are you going to just do it? And I picked up the yellow pages, and I found a call service, and I started going to men's houses and hotels and sleeping with them for money. And one day, my addiction got too ferocious, and I could not even feed my daughter. And I had seen girls out on the street, walking the streets, and I thought, Lori, you've been hitchhiking for an awful long time. You can get out there and hitchhike, and maybe somebody will offer you some money, and um, um, maybe they won't, but it's worth a try. So I went out on the streets that day and I stuck my thumb out and um, that was the beginning of the end for me. I started working the streets as a prostitute. My mom took my daughter away, which was a great thing because she was not safe in a hotel room with some guy that just got out of prison while I'm working the streets. And I remember in the beginning of working the streets where it felt powerful because I was making more money than my parents made and I wasn't doing anything. But what I didn't realize back then is as an abused child, I had separated my mind from my body and my body didn't mean anything to me. I had desensitized anything that happens to my body when I was an abused child from my dad's beatings. So the fact that I was selling my body meant nothing to me, but it started to resonate towards the end. And it was January 5th, 1987. I was 23 years old and I had been on the streets for quite a while and I had experienced a lot of bad experiences and a car pulled up and I got in the back seat and there were two men in the front and they jumped on the freeway. And at this point I knew jumping on the freeway is bad. You're supposed to go in a motel or an alley, but definitely not on the freeway. And I could see the driver's eyes in the mirror. He looked crazy like he was trying to get somewhere. And I looked around me and it looked like traffic hour and I thought, Lori, you've got to get out of this situation. I've been in some very bad situations that I don't talk about but I wrote about in my book. And I knew I had to get out. So I looked around me and I thought, 
I've got to get them in an accident. I don't care about the accident. I just got to get out of this car. So I jumped out of the back seat and into the front, grabbed the wheel to try and make them crash. And the guy on the right side saw me come in and hit me in the side of the head. And I just blacked out in the back of the seat. The next thing you know, we're in the woods somewhere and they get out of the front seat and into the back and the driver has a gun. And I guess a prostitute had killed one of their friends and they were going to kill a prostitute that night to make do for their friend. And I was that girl and I'm in the back seat of the car and somehow the guy on the passenger side changed his mind. He didn't want to kill me anymore. Something in his heart changed and he was fighting with the guy with the gun and after hours of being raped and beaten and having that gun to my head in the back seat of that car, I realized, you know what, Lori? They don't realize who they have here. You want to die. You've always wanted to die. Just make it all stop. Just make the memories go away. They've got a loaded gun. You're all on the same team. If you can convince them to kill you, it'll all be over. So I start screaming at the top of my lungs, kill me, please kill me. I thought, Lori, there is nothing left to say. Just get it over with. I scared them, but not enough to kill me. They got scared, I think, that someone would hear me out in the woods and come and arrest them. So they, they beat me till I was unconscious and left me for dead on the side of the road. And the next thing I know, I'm getting woken up and there's a van there and the exhaust pouring out of the back of the van. And I see a door open and I see big shoes, like a man's shoes, and he's struggling to pick me up. And I look down and I've just got a shirt on and a lot of blood. And I saw the white cloth seats inside of that van and I thought I do not want to get blood on this man's seat because I cannot take getting beat up one more time so I start struggling to get away from this guy just leave me alone just leave me I'm okay and the man picks me up to his eyes and he's got tears rolling down his face and he said please would you please just let me help you no I think there had been angels my whole life that God put in my life that tried to help me. When I thought back on my life in foster care and all of the people in the group home that come to see me and social workers and people that talk to me and therapists and a psychiatrist and Carl back at the group home, all of these people that had intervened and tried to help me over the years, I knew clearly what they said and clearly what they were trying to do, but I never let anyone break down my guard because I always thought I can do it myself, I don't need your help. But I remembered in my heart and in my mind what they said and I think on this particular day, I was broken down enough from what just happened in the car to accept help. And I let this man help me and he put me in his, in his van and he took me to the hospital and he must have paid for a cab back because the cab said, where do you want to go? And the only place I knew to go was Fifth and Harbor where I worked the streets because I needed to get more drugs to forget what just happened to me. And that's how it was for a while, just to forget, just to forget. So I get back there and I'm barefoot with a hospital gown on and I stick my thumb out and that's how that day went. And the next day I called my mom and I said, mom, I need help. And she hung up on me, rightly so. I've done a lot of bad stuff to my mom. And then I called this guy, Tom. Now, Tom was the first guy that I met when I worked for the call service. It was Christmas Eve and I arrived to Tom's house and um, this would be the first trick I ever turned and he was a paraplegic man and he had no lights out and he had no menorah and I couldn't understand what was going on with this guy. But what I learned was that Tom left home when he was 14 because he was an abused child and then he joined the Marines and he got shot and that's why he was a paraplegic. And Tom over the years would chase me down on the streets trying to help me because somehow through helping me, Tom was going to heal himself. So I called Tom and I said, Tom, I need help. And he said, Lori, I will take you wherever you want to go, but I will not give you one more dime. I had taken a lot of money from Tom. And I said, Tom, that's okay. Please come get me. And he took me to a little detox center down by where I live and he couldn't get his wheelchair up the stairs so he dropped me off and the counselor said just go in the room and rest and we'll get with you later on for a group and I looked into the room and there was just matching bedspreads and curtains and little doilies on the dresser and I didn't feel worthy of even sitting on a bed. I collapsed on the floor and I was like in a praying like position and I said God please help me. Please could you help me? I don't know what that looks like. I don't even really know what help means but if you could just be with me now. And then my head kicked in, the head that's been following my, my whole life, and it said, Lori, God's not listening to you anymore. Every time you've lied to God, every time you were in jail, every th time you thought you'd never see your daughter again, you made a deal with God. God always came through. You never come through. He knows you're a liar. He's not listening to you anymore. But I'm here to tell you that was January 6, 1987, 27 years ago, the last time I ever drank or used, and there's nothing nothing you could do to make God stop loving you or listening to you. But it took me a long time to get that. 
So I went through that place for a week and then I moved back to Tom's house for three weeks waiting for a recovery home to open. And um, I got into a recovery home which was supposed to be a month and I ended up staying there a year. During the time I was there, my daughter had to go into foster care which was really hard for me because I didn't want my kid in the system. But the foster mom told me, if you get a year clean and sober, I'll give you your daughter back. So I stayed there for a year and for the first time in my life, I would talk about what happened with my dad and the gun. I always kept that secret in the, in the hopes that someday he would love me. But at this point, I knew that that secret was the thing that was bringing me down and when I started to share that with people it's I started to separate myself from that and I actually started to see myself as lovable and maybe a little bit smart and not and maybe a little bit pretty I started to see myself differently and I walked out of that darkness and those dark um, memories that had been carrying me from my childhood and when I got ready to get out of that place they said Laura you got to get a job now and you got to be honest on your job application and I thought how is that gonna work because um, prostitution is not gonna be good on there so um, <laughs> So I lied and said I knew computer systems. I didn't, and but they taught us how to interview, a strong handshake, eye contact, smile, tell them you can do it. So I got a lot of jobs. Um, I got fired a lot because I couldn't even find the power button on the first system, and um, that was a clue. But um, I got out of that place, and I had a good computer job, and I got my daughter back and um, out of foster care, and I started a little meeting at my house for women that were struggling with drug addiction that had children. So kind of a single mom's meeting. It was like an AA, and a Narcotics Anonymous type meeting, just an open meeting for women that had children. And one night, this woman showed up, and she said, I have a 12-year-old back at the crack house I just left, and I can't get sober and leave my daughter at a crack house. A trick had driven her to the meeting. So um, I, t I went back in my room and I talked to God, and I thought maybe I could help her. I mean, my daughter was back. She had a bunk bed. We were paying the bills. She was in school. It was just down the street. I was working. I went back out, and I said, you know what? I think I'll watch your daughter for a month if you go get help. I showed her where there was a sober living, and she dropped her 12-year-old daughter off. And her 12-year-old daughter, daughter um, Shannon, was my karma. I tell her to stay home, she'd tell me to F off. Um, she stole everything I had. I love this kid. I was just crazy about this kid. I mean, she reminded me so much of my little self. And um, two months into having Shannon, I realized her mom hasn't called her come by, so I call over to the recovery home, and um, they told me she left. She relapsed like three weeks ago. And I'm like, what? I have her kid. And they said, well, we don't do kids. We do recovery. Call social services. So I called social services, and they said, you could drop her off over here at the children's agency. And I said, I can't drop her off. This kid has no one. She doesn't even realize her mom's gone, and I'm going to drop her off at a building. The lady on the phone said, well, you can apply to be a foster mom. I said, great. So I applied. They look at my file like prostitution, receiving stolen goods. You know, really not foster mom material. But if you get like seven years clean and sober, you can come back and reapply. But right now, you need to go home, get that kid, and bring her back. And I was so traumatized. I, they didn't have cell phones back in those days. I got home, and I called a bunch of friends. And someone told me I could apply for guardianship. And if they approved it, I could keep her. And even in the midst of the process, I could keep her. So I applied for guardianship, and I win guardianship of her. And Shannon had a hard time. Her mom ended up dying of a drug overdose shortly after. And Shannon had to reconcile with that and realize that her mom was a drug addict, and it wasn't that she didn't love her. And by the time Shannon was 18, she was the receptionist at the computer company I was working at and things were starting to go really good but at some point I realized I may never be able to give my daughter a normal life because I have this whole failure to bond ever since I was a little kid I may never get married so I told my daughter let's try and move into a neighborhood where people own their homes so we could live like a normal family and we'll take half my paycheck and we'll send it away to some remote bank so I can't ATM it to death and that's closed on the weekends and um, we'll just do it like that and then we'll have a bunch of money and we'll buy a house so 10 months later because I'm impatient I couldn't wait the whole year um, we go out with ten thousand dollars and we're looking for a house and we find this new home builder and you know when you see a new home builder there's an office you have to go through so you can get to model a b and c so they try and trap you in the office right and sell you something but I look so young and I've got a white beater on and torn up jeans and a little girl with me and they don't pay any attention to me until I start coming back every weekend to look at this house and then they start to get to know us hey Lori hey Summer we're just going in to play a little bit and look at our house see I'm scared to talk to them I don't know about real estate interest rates I mean a juvenile hall GED kid right so I'm scared to do anything I don't want to get my daughter's hopes up so one day I come through and the lady says Lori I know you're scared. Go home, get your taxes. I'm gonna show you how you change your taxes around and you can buy a house for not much more than you rent in an apartment. So I learned to take direction. I get my taxes, I come back. By the end of the day, I'm signing paperwork for a three bedroom house. And I'm just like in awe that this is happening to me and my daughter. So I'm signing the paperwork. Our house isn't there yet. We just have this sign that says lot whatever. And we're showing up with our sign watching the house be built. And it's a three bedroom house. We decorate the third room for a girl in case she has a friend spend the night or something and we move in. 
Things are starting to go better and better at work. It's not that I'm the best systems engineer, it's that I'm so happy and grateful to be alive. I think when you've lived in the kind of darkness that I've lived in, you are just so grateful about every little thing. I mean, a parking spot will make my day. A piece of gum in my purse makes it for me. You know what I mean? Just anything makes me happy. And I'm so happy, happy that people keep on promoting me. I go from customer engineer to systems engineer to senior systems engineer to director of IT to owning the flipping company. And I am scared every time they promote me. I am so uncomfortable and scared. And things are going amazing. And one day I get a call from my older sister. Now, I am not friends with my older sister very much since she um, hid the gun on me when I was a child. But she called me, she was a single mom and had a four-year-old son, and she said, Lori, I have been beating Danny so badly that I need to bring him to your house right now and you need to call social services and you need to have Danny taken away from me before I end up killing him. And she shows up at my house with a social worker and sits down and she starts telling the social worker, I don't like Danny because he's a boy. And I don't like boys because my dad, and then she starts rolling out with what my dad did to her as a kid. And all this time I thought maybe I imagined it, maybe I dreamt it, maybe it wasn't real. And now I'm hearing it and now I am looking looking clear dead on on the cycle of abuse because I was a little kid that was beaten and taken away and now Danny's being beaten and he's going to be taken away and although you think it's good for me to be hearing the truth about what happened when I was a kid for me it was like you mean I'm not crazy you mean you had me tied to a bed in a straitjacket and I was never crazy all that stuff really happened and I was so upset seeing my little nephew get driven away that I applied to be a foster mom. I completely forgot what happened years ago with Shannon and I went into the office and then I remembered and I thought not with my nephew and the lady said Lori when we tell someone seven years they never come back. It's been just over seven years since the last time you were here. My little sister always says that odd or is it God Lori? And I think this is a God moment because I was not counting the time. They make me a foster mom. My older sister finds out she doesn't want me to have her kid. She gets through some anger management program at foster care and um, at social services rather. And she gets her, her son back and she never hits him again. And they had a beautiful life after that. So it's two days before Christmas and I'm at home and the phone rings and it's some lady. And she said, is this Lori Burns? And I said, it is. And she said, I've got you on the list as foster moms. And we've got a 15 year old that ran away from Vegas. Her mom abandoned her at birth and her dad's been molesting her. And we caught her going to school here in Orange County alone and I'm wondering do you still have that opening at your home and in my mind not out loud I'm like you've got me on a list are you kidding me I could have picked up any kid any time it's two days before Christmas I've got a room all decorated for a little girl in this brand new house and you've got a little girl that's never had a mommy are you kidding? I couldn't get over there quick enough before they dig up my file and find out who I am. Um, so I'm, I'm over there in the children's home when she walked out and she was so beautiful. And I had a moment with God where I said, it does not make sense that a person like me, a heroin addict, prostitute, juvenile hall kid, could be chosen to be a foster mom. But I'm here to tell you, God does not make sense in my life. He makes miracle after miracle after miracle and never, never limit what God can do. I'm in my house and I have my daughter who's 15 and Catherine who just happens to be 15 as well and things are going crazy good for me. One day I walk out of my house and there's for sale signs everywhere in the neighborhood. I have no idea why. I know nothing about real estate. I asked my neighbor Brian, why is everyone leaving? He explains to me, my neighbors got used to me, um, Lori, our homes have appreciated. You take that appreciated money, you put that into another house and your houses just keep on getting bigger. And I thought that's the craziest thing I ever heard. This is my dream house, but I'm going to take direction, right? So I get a realtor over and I get the sign and I'm down on the grass and I'm talking to God. Now I had a problem with God ever since I was really little, as you know, and someone in the rehab that I first went through said, you could believe in anything as God, Lori, as long as it's not you. They said a rainbow or a tree. And I thought that's kind of hokey, but I did see a movie about God. So I've been praying to George Burns my whole time up to this year. Right. So I'm talking to George that day and I'm like, George, I don't know if I'm supposed to move out of this house. You know, if you want me to move out, you sell it within a month. If you don't, I stay. Right. So, um, three weeks later, my house sells for more than any other house in the neighborhood. I have no idea why. But now there's people moving into my house and I have to find a place to live. So I get on my motorcycle, I start driving through the canyon and I see these really big houses. And I go into the really big home builder to see how they're painting when I buy my little house. I'll know how to paint that's in style, you know? When I walk into the office, the lady from the original home builder had changed jobs and now she's in the new place. And I walk in, she's like, oh my God, Lori, I'm gonna sell you another house. I said, absolutely not. I'm just coming to look at the paint and I'm getting out, this is way over my head. She said, go home, get your taxes. Let me just see where you're at right now. So. <laughs> 
I go home, I get my taxes. By the end of the day, I'm signing a four-bedroom house with a loft. I have no idea why. But I realize now that God keeps on growing the house because God wants to give me more children. My daughter, who was four when I got sober, is um, 31 years old today. And she graduated from Columbia School of Social Work with two master's degrees, one in teaching and one in social work. And uh, she has a consulting agency in New York where she helps kids with autism and kids that are deaf. And it's because of the 17 sisters that she grew up with that she got accepted to her college, I believe. Right. My daughter, my daughter Catherine, who was 15 when she moved in with me, is 31 and lives down the street from me with her husband and my grandson Aiden. My daughter, who moved in with me when she was 12, Shannon, is 28 years old and has two of my grandsons. My daughter. Stephanie, who lives with me now, um, lost both of her parents when she was 12. And my daughter, Abby, who lives with me now, oh, has been with me since she was caught um, sex trafficked from foster care on the streets. And children of the night brought her to me. And my daughter, Chelsea, who moved in with me when she was 15, is 22. My daughter, oh, my daughter Kaylee, who moved in with me when she was 16 and testified against her dad, who got 127 years in prison for his sex crimes on children. Yes. is is married and has my first granddaughter and uh, Nikki who moved in with me when she was 15 is 22. Yvonne who moved in with me when she was 16 is 21 and has my grandsons Ryder and Skylar and I have 30 kids, 10 grandsons, one granddaughter and um, my, gran my um, son Michael who was my only son died on his motorcycle now two months ago and if it wasn't for the fact that I feel his presence with me all the time now I wouldn't have been able to handle this but I am so absolutely blessed I realize now how when I was a child and I thought God hated me for something I did in a past life I realize now that he loved me so much that he blessed me for what I would be in this life because if you've ever seen the Karate Kid, wax on, wax off, why am I doing this, Mr. Miyagi? It doesn't make any sense. My whole childhood was wax on, wax off for what I would be as an adult. I remember one night in the middle of the night, I was woken up by noise outside of my room. I had five little girls living in my house at that time, all teenagers. And I exited my room, and the hallway was dark, and the bathroom was dark, but I could see the silhouette of one of my kids lying on the floor, banging her head on the wall because she's having flashbacks of the abuse that happened to her, and screaming in that bathroom. And I remember going into that bathroom in that darkness and knowing not to turn on the light and knowing not to touch her and knowing not to talk too loud because in that moment, in that bathroom with her, I am 12 and I'm in the bathroom at my house and I know exactly what to do. And all of the little girls heard us and came out of their rooms and huddled around us and we talked about God and love in such a way that it transmitted so much light on that dark darkness in that dark room that it could not exist anymore. And it's in those moments where I could take someone who's in the darkness and grab their hand and lead them out into the light because I know the path that I am so absolutely grateful for everything I ever went through in my entire life with my dad on the streets I wouldn't change one moment of my life because it is absolute gold when you could use it to help someone else now people say to me all the time Lori you do such great things with these kids you're like an angel that doesn't resonate with me I'm just a normal person I may be surrounded by angels since that day in the woods and these kids, they're like my family. I met my family when I was 12 in a group home. So when they call me with a kid, it feels like my brother. It feels like my sister. I can't leave them out there just like you couldn't leave your brother or sister. So I always felt like God wanted me to do more. There was something more that he wanted me to do. And I didn't know what it was. And people think I'm crazy when I said this. But... In 2007, I start waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning every night. Not 3.02, not 3.01, 3 o'clock. I thought it was my sprinklers. I checked. My sprinklers are not going off at 3. They're going off at 6. And I'm getting tired. I work at Northrop Grumman. So, David, one of my competitors here. <laughs> I work at Northrop Grumman, which is like an hour from where I live. And it's a, it's a long drive to be waking up at um, 3 o'clock in the morning. So... I'm getting tired and I'm sharing about it a lot at AA meetings. A man comes up to me after an AA meeting, he's American Indian, he said, Lori, the American Indians believe that the spirits talk the loudest at 3 a.m. So if you're waking up every night at 3 a.m., God's trying to tell you something. Now I had this little God box. A man had told me when I was newly sober, if things are worrying you, this is my daughter in foster care and everything was just going crazy in my head, put it in your God box and write a note to God and hand it over to him and once it's in the box, you let go of it. And if you find yourself thinking about it again, remember God has it. 
So knowing that I'm waking up at 3 in the morning and God wants me to do something, I start writing notes to God. Um, telling me, you know, please tell me what you need for me to do. And all of a sudden I start getting invites, how to build a boys town, this and that, all kinds of invites. And I'm going everywhere. And then I get a call from the supervisor of the county. Someone in their office recommended me to serve on the foster care advisory board. Uh, there are three foster parents that serve on the board. At first I thought they must have totally lost my file um, because now I'm going to serve on the board. But then I realized it's because I'm taking the kids that nobody else wants that I show up on this board, right? So the worse the story is, the more I want the kid. So I'm at the foster care advisory board, I'm sitting with probation heads and county heads and I'm feeling quite nervous because I'm new and I'm out of my element and it's two guys walk into the meeting and they're ruffled, totally ruffled and they report in and they say they were following three kids that left foster care and they lost them all. And I was like dumbfounded. What do they mean they lost them? Did they die? What, what does that mean? I was so upset but I couldn't get the courage up to raise my hand and they talked about emancipation. Now I had heard about emancipation hearings, we never went to them because I was keeping my kids. So I went home and I googled emancipation and I found out that 65% of the 25,000 kids exiting foster care were going homeless on their 18th birthday or other kids are getting ready for prom and getting dressed up and thinking about college. Our foster kids are going homeless and people, the judges know, the probation officers know. How is this happening? How do I not know I'm a foster mom? I was so devastated. I thought I've got to do something. Now there had been people in my life that had helped me and things that I specifically remember, one man told me that Martin Luther King talked in such a way that he could transmit his, his dream, his vision to the hearts and the minds of the people in such a way that they could see it in their mind and they could feel it in their heart even though it didn't exist now. And if you could talk that way, Lori, people will follow you. Another man said if you put a bunch of fleas in a jar and they hit their head on the top of the jar, maybe it's four inches tall, the fleas will jump three inches tall for fear of hitting their head on the top. And if you let those fleas out of the jar, they will always jump three inches for fear of hitting their head. Lori, he told me, you are living your life like you're still in the jar. You need to realize that everything is available to you, Lori, everything in the world, and you need to jump bigger in life. And then the most important message came from an older woman who was quite psychic, and I was sitting with her, and she looked up at me very serious, and she said, Lori, one day you're going to be a little girl swinging on a swing, and the next day you're going to be an old lady. Your life is going to go by like that. Make sure you do what you need to do in this lifetime while you are still here. Now, I took all of that very seriously. And I told Linda, we've got to do something. And we started, we went on LegalZoom. We filed for a nonprofit. We didn't know what the heck we were doing. We were doing it like throwing spaghetti at the fridge. If it sticks, we keep it. If it falls, we don't do it that way anymore, right? So uh, we started applying for grants. So the first grant we applied for was uh, on this grant website. We looked at all these different foundations. But this guy was a cute cowboy. And we said, OK, this is it. We'll apply for this one, right? So we're just crazy, going crazy, asking people for money. We had um, the like 30 people in the community following us, listening to us, meeting us at meetings. We had $400 in small donations, like fives, tens, twenties that people had given us. And we went to Washington Mutual and we cried all the way there. And we were not crying because of the amount of money. We were crying because people believed in us. People were following us. 10 months later, we had $180,000 in that little account. And Linda's like, we got to do something. And I'm like, yeah, we do. So we found this little old granny house by where we live, a little three bedroom. We thought we could take a couple of kids that are homeless. We could put them through college. Well, the guys that were following us said, this house is not good enough. They knocked it down to the bolts and they built it up as a six bedroom house. And volunteers came from everywhere. They put in wood floors. They put in a new kitchen. They um, designed each bedroom specifically for different girls. And we took five girls off the street and put them through there and started to put them through college. And I thought with 25,000 kids aging out of foster care, this isn't enough. So we started this street outreach where we would bring food cards and bus cards to kids on the street and bring them shelter resources. And then the guys on my technology team at Northrop Grumman said, you know what, I can create a SQL database of every shelter in the United States and we could do like a hotels.com online where any kid in the nation could put in where they're at and they'll return the shelter on the screen on the website like a portal so they can get access to all the resources. So we did that. And then I told that guy, his name was Matthew. I said, Matthew, kids on the street have cell phones. They'd rather actually have a cell phone than a sandwich like an older people because today's kids grew up on technology. He said, well, I have an idea where we could make a program where any kid could text the word shelter in their zip code to our short code and it'll respond with a text to their phone with a closed shelter and they can get um, their website, the phone number, and they can get transport there. And he said, but it's going to cost $15,000. I said, Matthew, I don't have $15,000. 
The very next day, I got a FedEx envelope from a lady. It said, I forgot to give you your donation last year. Here's $10,000 for last year, and I thought I'd include this year as well. So here's $20,000 for you. I returned to work. I'm like, Matthew, I just got $15,000 for our program. Today, any kid in the nation could text the word shelter and their zip code to 99,000 within 40 seconds, and local shelter will show up on their phone. And they can keep on going through the shelters. So I'm thinking, God, this is, this is still not enough. And someone said to me, Lori, you've got to come to LA. There are homeless kids all over LA. Well, I thought, you know what? I live in Orange County. I drive to LA to get to work. That's a far drive. And now I got to come there on the weekends too. I'm not so sure about LA, but I will show up. If God wants to have it, we'll have it. So I show up to LA to an organization that's feeding homeless kids pizza and giving them clothes twice a week. And I'm there when the kids walk in. And we're talking 19, 18 years old with wounds on their feet because they don't have shoes and bugs in their hair and I'm like I can't not do LA I could not believe although I appreciated what this place was doing giving them pizza and salad and some clothes I thought would you put your own daughter your own son back on the street after feeding them this is not the way we have to do it we have to give these kids their life back so I started looking for a place and I found this big warehouse off the sand and a man that said he wanted to do something good with this warehouse. He had gotten it from his mentor, but the rent was going to be $100,000. And I didn't have $100,000, but I said I'd try and raise it. And I went out there and I could not raise the whole $100,000. So I returned to him and said, I can't do it. He went over to his desk drawer, grabbed a key and handed me the key and said, Lori, build it and they will come. And someday the money will be there and you will pay me. But for now, just build it. So I move into this warehouse. I don't know how to decorate it. People again come from all over the community, volunteers, they come in and they decorate this beautiful, amazing drop-in center. You would not believe is a homeless youth drop-in center. And I am just in awe of this. Now, last year, a little bit over a year and a half ago, two men approached me. One is an actor and the other one is a movie producer. And they want to create a place called Freehab where any homeless person could walk in and get recovery. One man has a vision that will take an old treatment center and will give, uh, will just resurrect it and will make a drug and alcohol treatment center. The other man has a vision that will take a warehouse and will put barracks in it and they'll come in through that. And I take both assignments and I said, I'll look at every warehouse and every treatment center I can until we find what we have. We find a warehouse connected to a treatment center. It was insane, right? So I bring them over there and they're like, that's it. Well, let me tell you on the day I go to sign the lease, they're both gone. One of them had to do six movies and he couldn't focus on this and doing, you know, the, the children's shelter. The, at that point it was an adult shelter and the movies. And the other man went on tour, right? So I'm standing there with the lease thinking about a hundred bed facility for homeless kids. And all I have is the down payment for this place. And I'm looking at the signature going, what do I do? Do I trust God enough? The, the budget on this place is 1.8 million if I make it go. And I've got 50,000 for the down payment. I sign it because I, the, also the, the uh, lease person that I was negotiating with said I could have six months for free. This gives me six months to work with God to try and come up with that 1.8 million. I sign the lease in pure faith that something's gonna happen. The next thing I know, I get a call from a man. He's read my book. He said, Lori, I just read your book and I feel like I need to help you and I don't know how. And I said, well, what's God telling you to do? Because I truly believe that we all know what we're supposed to do, but we don't always listen to the voice that's so quiet. And he said, God is telling me to wire you a half a million dollars and have someone match the other half a million. And I said, that sounds like an amazing thing. The next thing you know, We've got half a million dollars in our account. And I can tell you now through a bunch of more angels showing up and uh, people that contributed to decorate these rooms over Christmas that on Monday, this coming Monday, we will open our facility for 100 homeless youth in Los Angeles to provide them with tr free drug and alcohol treatment and trade school on site in the warehouse. the most amazing life. I was sitting with my kids the other night and I get a little nutty around my kids and I was telling them I have the most amazing life. I wouldn't even trade with Angelina Jolie. And they were like, oh. I said, I would tell her to go back to Brad. I'm keeping this life. Um, so I, um, I was speaking on a cruise ship a couple of years ago and when the cruise line docked, my cell phone turned on and it was jingling like crazy and I figured that was work. You know, I got a little break on the cruise because there was no signal. But now my cell phone's jingling and I picked it up and there was a message from a man. He said, this is Dr. Green in Florida. I have your father with me. There's been an incident and I need you to call me immediately. 
Now, I had been working on my book at that time, and I was in one of the darkest spots in my book, and I was scared to call him. I also need to tell you that through my own therapy, I realized that maybe nobody ever loved my dad. Maybe that's why he was such an angry man. Now, I heard what Gandhi said about be the change you want to see in the world, and I took that pretty darn seriously, and I thought, I'm going to be the change I want to see in my family. I'm going to be a change for love and forgiveness for all the people that have given me love and forgiveness and helped me to heal. I'm going to be changed in my family, and that does not mean that I'm expecting anyone, anyone to do anything else in my family. I'm just going to be a stand. I'm not going to think like the stand. I'm going to be the stand. So I started writing letters to my dad telling him all the good things about him and, and sending him letters telling him that I loved him and I was so grateful for him and I think that's the reason I'm getting the call today because I called that man back and he said your father tried to take his life and the life of his girlfriend. He told us he had no family. Two days ago he said he had one daughter and her name is Lori and you could call her now and he gave us your number. Now I have two sisters so it had to be those letters. So I... Uh, he said, I could put you on the phone with your dad, but I got to tell you, your dad's in very bad shape right now. I need to clear that with you before I put you on the phone. And I said, put me on with my dad, even though I was scared to death. And my dad got on the phone and he said, how dare you? How dare you love me? How dare you forgive me after all I've done to you? I don't deserve to live. I deserve to die. And I said, dad. Do you realize it's because of everything I went with with you? It's because of my child, it's a childhood. It's because of every day with you that I live this most brilliant, amazing life today that I wouldn't trade for anyone's life. And I wouldn't change a day. And I love you, Dad. And I forgive you. And that was so long ago. You need to forgive yourself. And he was crying very loudly. So the man got back on the phone. And he said, you know, I can't release your dad. He's a danger to himself and others. The only way I can release him is back to your custody. Now here's the man who put me in the mental institution and they're calling me to see if I can get him out of the mental institution. Now I remember one day when I was reading the Bible, and I know I'm Jewish, but I just wanted to peruse through and see what you guys have on the other side. So um, I was like uh, reading through the Bible and I read some story about some Jewish guys, um, a guy named Joseph that was sold into slavery and then he became the, the king and he was able to save his brother and his father and I thought you know this is very similar to that it's a full life orchestration here a full life circle and I accepted my dad back and I picked him up at Long Beach Airport and he was crying and I said dad I love you and I will, will always talk about what happened to me to help the other foster kids that are out there but that doesn't mean I don't love you dad and what I found out was that my dad was a foster child that was abused and my loving grandmother that I could never reconcile why she was so loving and he was so angry was my foster grandmother and at that moment my whole life came full circle I'm gonna share one more thing and then I'm gonna let you guys go I um, Tom, the man, the paraplegic man in the wheelchair, he's, he never dealt with his childhood. He doesn't like to talk about stuff about Vietnam or his childhood, so he's still a very, very angry man and he's very alone. And I called him one day and I said, Tom, I want you to come by and see the house that I have for the charity. Now he knows I do some charity shtick, but he doesn't really know what it is, but any opportunity to get out and hang out because he doesn't have many friends. So he said, okay, I'll come over there. And he met me out front and he wheeled up to the front of that place and on the door it says, Fauntleroy. And then it says House of Hope and a bunch of stuff from Shakespeare about hope and enlightening the lives of others. And he looked at me and he said, Lori, why is my name on the door of this house? Because his name is Tom Fauntleroy. And I said, Tom, you saved my life. He said, Lori, I gave you a ride. I said, Tom, do you realize that ride and that little teeny peanut of hope was more than I ever could have conjured up with inside myself. And that little peanut of hope that you had for me was enough to bridge my life out of hell and into the amazing life that I have here today. And he tried not to cry, but I could see him welling up. And I've got to tell you people, you know, I know that we work with these kids and we don't always hear a thank you and we don't always hear them telling us that they got what we said. But as one of those kids that grew up this way, I can tell you we get it. We just don't always have the capability of telling someone they helped us or telling someone thank you. We don't always know how to do that. So if you're thinking I'm helping all these kids and it's not working, you're wrong. It is working. It's getting in there. We're planting the seeds. We don't always get to see the flower grow. But we are definitely planting the seeds. And I have to tell you how absolutely grateful and honored I am to have been here today to tell my story to you. And I hope in some way that God has enlightened and opened your heart 
and triggered in you that you need to do more and more every day for these kids because you are saving lives. Thank you for letting me share.